musicians in bars getting beer. Actually, wait a second. Musicians in what bars getting say? banquet burgers. Yeah, <laughs> musicians in Johnny's. Actually, I called it walrus burgers on, <laughs> on the internet. So, uh, Constantine Alexander Karzis. Musicians in bars getting beer. How you doing, sir? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for being on the show. My pleasure, Z. Anytime. All right. Let's talk about the rattles right off. Um, sure. What's up? What's up with the rattles? Uh, the rattles are uh, the rattles are a postmodern uh, Beatles tribute. <laughs> uh, we're actually no, we're playing uh, we're playing at the CNE. This is going to be the fifth year in a row, uh, and this time we're doing like our sets have grown over the last three years. Like at first it was like a set and a half, and the last two years have been three four sets. This year we're doing five sets. Cool. Um, so really looking forward to that. Uh, we've been working on entire records like uh, in other words sort of don't, not just songs from Abbey Road but let's just do Abbey Road yeah. kind of like uh, note for note or uh, classic albums however not with all the tracks represented in other words just the, the essence oh, of yeah. it the songs okay. accurate and the playing accurate but the essence is, got, is what has to be accurate which sure. I think that people say we, we deliver that so that's awesome and do you do uh I think you do some eras, like you emulate the eras? Yeah, we go from basically from the basement of the cavern to the rooftop of Apple Records, like yes. from the alpha or the omega to the alpha, you know. And, and so it's the whole dress up and... <laughs> yes, I, I know that guy anyway. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah, and his, yeah, and his wife, but it, no, it's a whole thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, we do, we do if they're paying, like, I mean, you know, as a... As, course, a, as a 52 year old man uh, to put on a wig and dance around with a you know crazy little accent it's not easy you know you gotta give us some money for the first you know okay. so we do do it and then we also do sort of the middle later periods the only thing that we don't have not touched on yet is is like the Sgt. Pepper garb mm -hmm. because I don't even think the Beatles liked wearing they were like pajamas oh, yeah. you know and if we were gonna do it Harry Rosen would sort of cut a proper double breast just you know do it right yeah, cuff length sort of thing, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we enjoy it. And we also play a lot of shows just as we are. But the personas are there because the actual people in the band correspond to their particular personality, who Absolutely. they're portraying. Yeah. Like, Joe is very Ringo. He's very much the glue, very much the mediator, and very much the, the beat, you know. Uh, 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 Antonio is very John, you know, you know and he'd argue that he's not, but he is, you know. Uh, uh, Dave, David is very George. Very George. Quiet, shy, a yeah. bit angry, um, you know, a bit sort of reserved, but a great player and a great voice. So and what makes you like Paul? Then? Because, you know, I'm the one that's got... If, <laughs> For a person who's not very organized, like Grand and Toy does, like I'm, I'm barred from Grand and Toy. Uh, 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 I'm the one that's sort of, all right, lads, let's, you know, we're gonna do this. It's gonna, be, we're, we're making ten dollars. It's gonna be fantastic. It's for charity, and uh, yeah, I kind of like, I push everybody, and and I, you know, I realize how pushy I can be, you know, but I mean, I mean well. Do you guys have the same ego issues as the Beatles? Between yes. Between Paul and and John. Yes. That would be that I love John, and you know what? His whatever he wants, it's fine. But he's got problems with me, you know. <laughs> so yeah, we it does it does happen that that does come into play. But but it's a healthy fire. It's sure. it's not divisive. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Derisive. No, I derisive. found it. I found it very charming. I I, listen, it's it's, it's like, like a dream it's come just true. Like the real band. Yeah, it really is, you know. <laughs> and for all intents and purposes, like when when it's gelling and it's clicking and it's happening and you can feel the, the sort of feedback from the audience it's really kind of a, a, a like it's it's like a, a, a holy experience it's sure is, yeah. it's very spiritual yeah. to, to do you know it, let's put it this way Tony once said we like doing this so much we, pro we do it for we do it anyway you know the money's just gravy That's no right. gravy well gravy's gravy we do it for gravy. <laughs> do it for the chips. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> now, All of right. course, the Rattles need a movie. Now, if you did a Rattles movie... What would we do? 
It would be a, a, a parody on the Ruddles movie. No, no. What we do is we take the... <laughs> remember Kiss did Phantom of the Paradise? Yes. Well, we'd go to the... like, If the drive-in still erected in the old neighborhood... <laughs> the old Don the Valley The Don Valley, Valley drive-in. Yeah, okay. We'd do like... Like mystery at the at the Don Valley Drive-in, <laughs> smoke a bunch of weed, and like, <laughs> like kind of get confused and <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know what we do. Well, we do something something silly, either very silly or very serious. <laughs> Who are the Beatles? <laughs> Actually, I got I got a story for you. Um, I was at this uh, uh, Fringe Festival uh, party. I was in a, a play in the Fringe, which we can talk about if you want. Um, and I went to one of these sort of like, hey, it's end of the fringe, and it's a, sort of the big sort of soiree at the end. And rain came on, the song. And it's like, oh, man, I love this song, and I was going to go dance, and there was this girl there, one of the actresses, young, perhaps 22, 23, uh, brilliant actor, I saw her show, and she goes like, oh, my God, I know this band. I go, yeah, they're, they're the Beatles, right? I said, like, they're the Beatles. And she goes, oh, heard of them and I was like <laughs> kind of stopped in my tracks I mean I get it but I you know and I understand but but certainly their legacy is out there and 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 has still influence as a matter of fact I probably sure. it probably will be studied for many many years you know not all the kids are musos now no that's true you know and so Drake is all they know because really. I like yeah. the way Drake sings like yeah. you know the, the uh. bow 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 when the si- I don't know you could do it. I could. could I need it. the script. <laughs> Speaking of scripts, Ooh. there's a segue. Yeah. What came first, the chicken or the egg? <clears throat> well, you know what? I always like both. Like always, always. And you can ask my, you know, my mom. Uh, like I was always into music and and was driven by it and and curious about playing it. I took piano lessons, and uh, and the only way I agreed to do the piano lessons is if my mom. I told my mom if I can play the drums as well and I was like that was a line in the sand and it actually worked out perfectly but in my piano studies I'd like you know learning the little notes and reading the notes was like I'd hear melodies I'd hear songs in between and I go to my teacher and I go like I play what I wrote and he goes that's not the piece and I you know at the conservatory and I said well I love it anyway so I'm you know I'm glad for the discipline but yeah music always and then drama as well because be- because of sort of like psychological insecurities, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Okay. Now you can't leave that one sit. Mm. Tell us more. Well, about it's that. funny because when I started, when I started theater, <clears throat> I, you know, Bill, I wasn't really the most, the the most highest academic achiever. Like I was, was left-handed and mildly dyslexic and slight as a, as a small lad and picked on and except the girls didn't pick well they picked on me but it was okay um, <laughs> you know but but I really excelled at like at singing or, or, or playing you know an instrument the drums and then I got a chance to sort of behave on stage in front of people if you will and and that was like the best part of it really the thing that sold me and I hope it's true for other people is that when it was our turn to do the play at, you know, in public school for Christmas, two weeks, for, for two weeks before the play, they took us out of class at 11 a.m. Yeah. And we went to lunch, we went to the teacher's staff room, had like Nescafe, instant coffee, sat around in chairs, read the play, and it was the best. It was like... It changed the uh, it just, school experience. It made, me, like, it made me feel like I could actually do something well, you know? And I don't know, maybe I, I hope I can. I hope I, I hope that I can still do it well. But what happened is it changed over time, because because the thing about art is is it is an ideal. It's it, it is something beautiful. It's something that one aspires to, and 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 without it, our our civilization is is barbaric. It's lost. Um, but but there is no art without commerce. And the commerce is what kind of can wear you down. I mean, I've worked with lots of actors, like, you know, like big, big movie stars, if you will. And they're just, you know, like they do their bit. And especially in film, not like, theater's different because you, you run a course from beginning, middle, end, right? But in a movie, you're in there and you're like, ah, oh, you know, like, better pay me my fucking money or like, I'm going to be 
kill you. Mm -hmm. I was like, cut, and then you're <laughs> you're waiting around for two hours. Right. You know, and it, it is like a it is a it's a craft. It's like a vocation. It's you can learn it via apprenticeship. It's not high minded, you know. Mm -hmm. But then again, neither is surgery. You can learn it by vocation, I think. You can learn anything by, by taking from a master. Like, I'd like, I'd like to learn about filming people from you. You know, this is, this is very interesting. Um, being high-minded about anything changes what that thing is. It Your does. Your art becomes credible, let's say. You know what? Know. Speaking of credible I'll art. I'll tell you something. I know that there's a university out there, either out there physically or on the interweb, where they'll give you a PhD for playing the kazoo. So people say kazoo, not legit, you know? It is. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm a kazooist. A kazooist. Yeah. Well, that makes you a musician, but you're also a bassist. Yes. Oh, you got yeah. a real Hofner? Yeah, I got a, uh, I got a real Hofner. I got a 67 Hofner that I got from the last days of Songbird, which, is, uh, which was on Queen Street West that I got from Songbird, which is on Queen Street West, was on Queen Street West, a week before they closed, I went in and I saw this left-handed Hofner. And, you know, I took it down, plugged it in. The thing was like, for lefties, it's not always the case. It was in perfect tune. Like, it was perfectly tuned. Put it through a, a Fender uh, basement with a big cab, silver face. And it was like, boop, 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 boop. so I was like, I, I have to have this bass. It was 1200 bucks. This is o over six, 15 years ago. Over. And uh, I said to the guy, look, I have $1,100 cash and that's all the money I had and I wasn't gonna pay rent because I was gonna ba buy this bass. The guy goes, you know, it's on consignment. It's not my uh, call to make. I go, well, can you contact the guy? He goes, well, we're closing on Friday for good. And I go, well, what are you gonna do with all the, he goes like, well, we're just going to return it to the, the guys that, and go, well, where's this guy? He goes, well, he's, he's camping in Alaska. <laughs> I go, well, can you get a smoke signal out to the guy? <laughs> so somehow he finally did get a hold of him, and, and he took the 1100, and I got the bass. And, and uh, you know, I had the bass before. I, I, I loved McCartney. I loved the Beatles. I was a bass player, but I'd never played in a Beatles band, and I'd never learned any Beatles songs. Oh, right. So, so I, I got the bass first, and then I met... Tony through a mutual friend of ours didn't realize that we'd grown up just several few blocks apart from each other. Is that right? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, he was on Apache and I was on Warfield. Oh yeah. And uh, and then through this guy, he had moved in up the street from me. He saw my bass. He goes, "Is that a real Hoffner?" I go, "Yeah." He goes, "You're a lefty." I go, "Yeah." Because do you like the Beatles? I go, "Love the Beatles." <laughs> you want? So we just started playing, and he already had Joe. And then Dave came in, and I thought Dave was an old friend of theirs, but Dave had never played in a Beatles band. He kind of had never met those guys. Hmm. So the first time we did, they learned Taxman and I Want to Hold Your Hand. And we just did that, did those two songs for like <clears throat> six hours. Wow. And, and it was great. And the rest has been like a, we learned it all together. We grew it, we grew it up together, you know? Yeah. So, and How I- How long ago was that? That was, se it'll be seven years in September. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, almost as long as the Beatles were together, you know. <laughs> People say, have you seen Rain? Have you seen so-and-so? It's like, yeah, I have. And, and they're great. You know, it's like the Ice Follies, you know. It's, it's a piece of theater that presents something as opposed to represents something. It presents the flash. And you don't go, it doesn't go much deeper. Like... We sat there and learned Abbey Road on our own dime and time because we were nerds about it. And that translates into when we play. People really freak, you know, like, like I mean, people have sort of commented. They've said, listen, the two comments we got last time we played, these ladies came backstage with their children. We did photos. And the one lady said, you know what, I just saw Rain in Las Vegas or something, and you guys are just, like, you guys are better than rain. I go, you're not just saying that because you're here and we're here and you want a picture. No, 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 I mean it. We're better than rain. The other lady goes, you know what? The only better, the only other Beatles band I've seen that's better than you is the Beatles. <laughs> and that, I mean, it was well, right she there. she saw them. Yeah, she saw them. She, she saw them in 65 here or 66 here. I'm sure there's a lot of fan stories like that. It's a perfect demographic for it. Like there are people that will have come up to us and 
See, the thing about the, doing the Beatles is there, there's a, the demographic now is like, let's say, 35, 30 to 60, 70. People that have seen the Beatles and love them and their kids sort of like, or their yeah. whatevers. Um, the ladies, like, people like to dance to it. Ladies yeah. and, and, and the younger love to dance. And it's also good for guys because there's guys out there that are our age, a little bit older, that are also musicians or have been in the past or they're enthusiasts. So they'll they'll ask about gear, and all our gear is, it's period gear. It's like the guitars are period. Like they're from the six, but nothing over seventy one. I don't think the drums the same. Joe Joe has like actually authentic, same year as Ringo's kit, and his snare, the Ludwig, the the, the sort of uh, uh, tiger stripe Lud, Ludwig, and. Um, and people just love that. And you know what? I remember, like, you know, there's orchestras out there like Tafel Music that play on period, pe period instruments. Well, playing the Beatles through period instruments makes it sound more like the Beatles, you know what I mean? It sure. really does make a difference. Oh, it's awesome. Well, you know, like you asked me a question about, about yeah. reporters and being silly or flippant or whatever. Sure. Um, I don't think anybody worth their salt as an artist from Dylan to Brando to the Beatles to would ever give a decent question, uh, would ever ignore a decent question. They'd give it a they'd give it a decent answer. But there's so many stupid questions. Indeed, questions. I mean, you know, I did a I did a, a press junket for a series that was featured during the film festival a few years ago, and I, I swear to God, one of the lines was like. One of, the, one of the questions was, so, how do you memorize all those lines? And I'm like, you call yourself a journalist? So anyway, that's my thing. So if, if the questions are good, the answers will be too. If they're not, then, you know, expect rain. I was thinking about if the Rattles were going to make a movie about, we'd make, we'd make Sgt. Pepper's because the oh, Beatles yeah. never did it. And Frampton and the Bee Gees, it was okay. Although I have mad respect for them. But yeah, well, who wouldn't want to do the movie Sgt. Pepper, Lonely yeah, Hearts? Yeah, right, right. You know? Yeah. Well, I think they did a pretty good time. Um, rather, I think they did a pretty good effort of it, Frampton yeah. and the Bee Gees. Oh, you know what? I, I that got, would be fun for sure. I, I uh, sort of found it on my on the Android box. I got one of those Android boxes. Pristine copy, like a HD copy. And it's so... It's like one of those, it's like, you know, songs will trigger nostalgic memories and stuff but this was one that's buried because you, I never saw the movie after it came out I saw it at the Fairview Theater there <laughs> with my girlfriend at the time Patricia Brown my hello brother, Patricia hello Patricia you're still lovely drove by your house the other day it's all the same you know um, uh, yeah and, and, and I hadn't seen it since so it really like you know how like when they're operating on you they oh my god I remember when I was six and my, my first goal it's like stuff like that oh, okay. Does that make any sense? Yes. yes. Strangely. Wait a minute. You interviewed Dave Barrett? Yeah, right here. That hack? Oh. <laughs> Bye, Dave. Love you. Nope. Um, it's funny because... That's it? That was the setup? Wasn't that good? That's all right. I think you should take another shot at sure, it. Sure, okay. Hang on. I didn't... <laughs> I'm, I thought... You, you interviewed Dave Barrett? Yes, right here. Whatever. You know, he's all right. He's, he's okay. <laughs> How long have you known him? Uh, since grade nine. Oh, boy. So that's, really? what, 43 years? I mean, uh, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah, I've known him for a long time, since grade nine, yeah. Did you guys play together? Briefly. Who else did you play with from our school? Bob Backick. Did you play with Bob? Bob? Yeah. Ravi Slabodan. Slabodan Budu. Slabodan Bukic, <laughs> whose dad was like a, like a beatnik. He was a great bass player. Great bass player. He had, I remember he, we had a band in uh, grade seven or grade nine with Hilkin, myself, Jim Bryan on guitar and Backick on bass. And Backick's dad won money at the track, so we bought him a, a four, 4001 Rick and, like a white Rickenbacker yeah. bass. He had like the best gear and we had one amp. You know, like three, two guitars, a micro, two microphones, drum set, and one amp. And we played the Bandonbury Bash at uh, Pleasant View. Oh, is that right? They rented amps for us, needless to say. 
all the drummers from the neighborhood brought their drums and I had a, a, like a 37 piece drum kit, like two rows of toms, right? And like three, I, four bass drums, <laughs> like it was madness, it was excess, like, but that was the 70s, right? Do you still play drums? Yeah. I bought the, I bought the kit from Pleasant View. It was a, a red premiere, Olympic, uh, 1976. I bought it and I still have it. Cause they, cause they were buying a Ludwig and they were gonna, they were just gonna recycle the drums or something like, like literally toss them. I said, you know, I said, I'll give you whatever you want for it. My dad said, I'd give you $50. They said, okay, sold. So <laughs> I got it like, and I, I still have it. And drums are like, you know, let's put it this way. M most bands, especially live and in studio as well, live and die by a great drummer. A great drummer, without a great drummer, you're like, great drummers create group sounds like Zeppelin or Police or Ringo. Rush or Ringo. You know, I mean, that, so that, many different beats. But, you know, well, I mean, look, the work that he does, and now that we're on the tangent, the work that he does on Day in the Life, it's not even drumming, it's a musical part. It's like beyond. It's streets ahead, as my son would say, of anything, you know? And to this day, as, as fresh as it was. I mean, that's the other thing about the Beatles, is like, you listen to, like, you listen to sounds of the 60s, right? It sounds like the 60s. The Beatles don't. They sound like, they sound like the universe, the silence of the universe. Like, you know, I know I'm a geek, but yeah. But yeah, great drummers do influence the sound of a group. Bad drummers, the group is doomed, you know? Who else did you play with? You said, uh... You said Chris Hilkin. I played with Hilkin. Uh, from the hood, I played with I played with everybody from the hood. Um, Barrett, Ian Prinsloo, um, some guy named uh, Jock. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, everybody that we know, probably that you've interviewed. <laughs> um, and, and then, and then later on, like in university, I played with uh, I played with guys that I met at school. And we had a group that sort of did the university circuits, which was fun. I mean, basically, what in one form or another, I've I've been in a band since I since I was twelve, like with maybe a year, like I think like a relationship. The longest I've been without a girlfriend or a band is a year, you know. Yeah. So. What's um? Do you have any recordings out there? Yeah, um, I, I I started playing bass uh, when I was about twenty four, twenty five. Um, and I sort of formed a band with a, a songwriter. Like I, look, I, I started to learn how to play bass and guitar because I wanted to write songs. I mean, they were coming, but I needed to learn how to express them. And a guitar is much more portable than a piano. And it's much more note, <laughs> noteworthy than drums. Although you can write drum songs from anything. So I, I, I figured the bass had two less strings than the guitar. So it should be a bit easier to learn. Like. Which is a, was a big surprise because playing bass and singing at the same time, right? It's like oh, doing man. this, you know. Yes. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, that's my career in a nutshell. So, <laughs> so I really sort of woodshedded and 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 like I, I was I had that bass. I think if I wasn't working, I was sitting on the couch playing bass, taking these courses from um, like on you know on video, I, and then I got a teacher who would give me a lesson and then say, come back in a month. And I go, well, why? He goes, like, just trust me. And it took me a month to, to learn how to, you know, what he, the fundamentals that he was teaching me. And uh, formed a band called uh, 33, like the number, mm -hmm. with a friend of mine, Jim. And we wrote a bunch of songs, uh, two records worth. They got placed on television. I mean, I'm a so -ca I mean, my goal was to, like, do something with it, you know, like I wanted, I, I wanted to, I thought that, Artistic, the, the expression of songwriting is one of the best artistic expressions there is, you know. And uh, we became members of SoCan, and we still get royal, like residual checks. <clears throat> Some of them are as high as fifteen, sixteen dollars. <laughs> Some of them are. <laughs> what, was it, what was the project? Uh, it was called Thirty Three. We did two records. One was called Chinatown, yeah. and the other one was called Demos for the Eternomatic. Um, can you still get these on iTunes? You can get them on iTunes. Yeah. yeah that's great. Okay. Uh, and the band was. It's called Thirty Three, and it's. Written and it's written out, and it's also numerally, numerically, you know. So either way, you'll find it. And so you were writing the songs, writing and singing, yeah. And singing. And we recorded, uh, 
We recorded at Phase One. We got them like right. we, we got sort of represented by a, a independent uh, management label, and we did the Bullard Show a bunch of times. Oh great! And we did. Uh, they're on. Um, one of the songs actually got on um, some big fat show, and it was a good paycheck. I mean, it's like amazing how. You look in the mail, and you usually you just either going to use the, the the bills that you haven't paid for lyrics, like if you have an idea, or you're just not going to look at them anyway. My uh, my my brother was over visiting from New York, and he's a busybody, and he said, "Oh, you got this envelope," and I opened it, and it's like it's a check for like six thousand dollars. I'm like, "Holy oh, fuck!" Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it was like made my made my made my year pretty much <laughs> um, so yeah that that uh, was a great project and then I also after that played in a band called The New Black and The New Black was every member was a great singer it was like the Eagles like five guys everybody could sing great harmonies three guys writing songs great songs we went to China we did a tour of China which was pretty surreal like this is like in uh, 05 oh, 06 07 and uh, I'd never, like, I'd never been anywhere like China. Um, cool. And they loved us. It was, like, it was, what a great experience. Well, tell us a China story. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'll tell you a China story. It was a long flight. And we landed, and it was nighttime in Beijing. We came off the plane, we, and we had gifts for them because we sort of, like, did some research, and it's like... There's a real respect and cultural sort of expectation, which I'm, I love, you know. So we gave them the gifts. They were really sweet to us. They put us in this great hotel. But everything in China, let's just put it this way. It's like Blade Runner without the rain, you know. <laughs> this hotel was just like unbelievably extravagant. And we woke up the next day around... 9, 30, 10, because we had to take a bus into the place where we were going to sound check. We had a gig the next day. We come out. There's a big bus. Guy brought, want some coffee? We had some coffee. And I look around, and it's sunny like this. But, and there's, but there's this crazy fog. Like, it's so thick. The fog is like, it's like, you know, when you're out at the CN Tower, and it's like, ball the fog rolls in. And I go, I go, wow. It's so foggy today. And the translator, his name was Daniel, he goes like, Oh, that's not the fog. That's the pollution. <laughs> and I go, Whoa. all right, he's laughing. And I kind of laughed along with him. I go, wait a minute. What do you mean it's the pollution? That's, that's thick, man. And, when I, and I'm not kidding. It was like between you and me, it, it, there was a haze. It was that palpable. And it kind of, you know, that diesel bus smell, a lot oh, yeah. of like that was... Anyway, that oh, aside, yeah. it was incredible. We'd go into... We rolled into this theater, which was a small theater of something like 16,000 seats. Like, and in the square beside the theater was like, think of, a, think of Dundas Square, completely full of bicycles wow. with not a lock on them. I'd never seen anything like it. And I'm scratching my head and I look over at the drummer, Brad, and I think, you know, we had a true telepathic moment. It's like, how do you find yours? Like they treated us wonderfully. Like it was, like it was, like people. I, I think that there's just a, there's something about Western culture that they just immediately have mass massive respect for, or or the, a mass desire for, or curiosity about. Because like I mean, they played our songs, and I, I think they did two two months of of promotion, like on the there's the three radio stations that they have, or something. But people like they knew our lyrics. They sang along. Like oh, that's great. Yeah, it was really great. It was it was lovely. And they were all you know uh, so formal and 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 we never like we ate in all these really nice restaurants, but always in a private room. And I said, why don't like why don't we just eat? He goes he goes take a look and think about think about Young Street Young and Bloor at five o'clock in the afternoon. Think about. Fifth Avenue uh, on a Saturday between Central Park and, and and whatever 42nd Street. Now times that by take take an exponent of that mm. to five. That is how thick with human like people walking, people riding bikes, people driving cars. Like you literally like we we'll, we had a day off and we went. They took us shopping. We were never unescorted. 
We were always chaperoned, which turned out to be a good thing. But you literally like just kind of butt your way in to, to go somewhere. And, and it was not rude. It was just the way it, it is. I, I, it was, I'd never seen, I, I was really, I wish I'd stayed longer because I, it was a cultural experience that is like no other. You think you know something because you see it or on TV or you read about it, but the being there, travel is the best thing you can do. That's why I ran away and joined the circus. <laughs> Uh, okay, so after that, uh, yeah, and I still write. Like, I mean, uh, I have a rep that reps my songs. People sing them. Now I'm writing for the youngsters. You know, like, you know, I'm a bit long in the tooth, thinking that if stuff doesn't work out, I'll take my savings and buy like a RV, and kind of go town to town, change my name, <laughs> Jack Diamond or something. Diamondopolis. Jack Diamondop. Diamopolis, yeah. <laughs> Well, so grade ten, basically, I um, grade nine, I did, I, I did, I did a triple threat. I played in the band with Hilkin and Bakic. It was called Phoenix. This is the band in Barry Bash. The end of season, sort of end of the year, sort of. You had the sports day, and then you had the dance. Yeah. We played at the dance. We played two songs. You, uh, Let the good times roll by the cars, and uh, Cat Scratch Fever by Ted Newton, because Mr. Henderson chose. The, the program for the evening. I was taking piano lessons from Henderson and I, and Bread's uh, uh, if, if, the song, if a picture paints a thousand words. So I played piano for that while these two girls from, from oh, the I choir see. sang. Cool. And then I was in a play, that, like a vignette. So that sealed my fate. I, I went to Mac, Kivesto's my teacher. She says, you should join the theater company. Eric McCormick's my fucking, the guy who runs it. You know, he didn't. He wasn't threatened by me, and I wasn't threatened by him. I have mad respect for him. Um, and, and you know, it was like launched on the path. So my two, the two courses I took throughout were music and drama. And uh, the, thank God, because that's how I got my diploma. Otherwise, I would <laughs> never have graduated. <laughs> Did you work with Eric after high school? Uh, I've worked with him on a couple of shows. Like I don't remember what, um, but. I, Certainly our paths crossed because a very good friend of mine, Peter Otterbridge, is, is good friends with him. Um, but then you think about it, lots, lots of great people came from that school. Like Mike, uh, Mike Myers was... Mike Myers didn't spend a lot of time at he, Mac, but he, but He was there but and yes. he was in Scarborough. Mean, when I say that school, Scarborough yeah. in general, like it's a and, breeding and ground. Dave Furnish. Dave Furnish. And... Uh, Dave Barrett. Neil Crohn. Neil Crohn, who I love. And uh, uh, Eric McCormick. Deborah who, McGrath. Deb McGrath, who, who came... I knew her. I knew who she was because I'd gone to Second City and she was great. And she came to talk to us on career day. And she goes, don't go into acting, whatever you do. But she was lovely like and hilarious. So, you know what? Listen. Colin Mockery. Colin, yeah. yeah. Billy Blair. Billy Blair. The Bare Naked Ladies. All those cats. Bare Naked Ladies. Uh, Sloan. Somebody said One Sloan's. of the Sloan guys. The glasses yeah. guy in Sloan. Okay. I like him. From North Rodeland, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know what? Let's put it this way. You know, it was like it was a great time to grow up, and uh, I mean, you know, the other day, the radio, I'm, I'm getting in the car, and the radio's like it's going through the stations. It's Q107, and it's more than a feeling by Boss. More than a feeling, and um, I'm with my son who gets it because <laughs> he's in a music program at, at at McGill, but he's with a, a, one of his pals who's not a musician. He's kind of like a you know slacker, 21 year old guy. And he goes, oh man, like this crazy music. And I go, I go, and then it just hit me. I didn't say anything, but it hit me. Like you listen to music today and it's, and yes, I am old and it's not just cause I'm old, but songs like that with what they had going on, like the guitar breaks, the vocals, like how high and how earnest it was, really kind of made you feel invincible. Like it didn't make you think of necessarily sex in, in, an, in a purely, uh, uh, egotistical way it was very romantic but also very it was very sort of like you know made you feel great and that I think is 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 an, really shaped us in, uh, in terms of an era sure. you know if you will we we're talking inside about the uh, in my era it was the Led Zeppelin versus Rolling Stones argument not Beatles versus Stones. I know I'll get I get Beatles versus Stones and I, I used to get, I mean, people come up to me, I mean, you just finished doing a show. It's like, thank you very much, hey Jude, no, 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 good night, we love you, blah, 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 off stage. Some guys like, hey man, great, Beatles or Stones? 
Well, I am wearing a mop top wig and black suit, and carrying a left handed bass. What do you like better? And I was like, I go, there, there's no comparison. He goes, oh, so Stones, right? I go, mm, mm. I go, there's just no comparison. He goes, what do you mean? I go, you know what? It's like it's not even com like comparing apples and oranges. It's like comparing a tree and a dolphin. <laughs> like it's, com it, yes, the only thing is the tree can be on the land and the dolphin can be swimming in the same area, but that, they're era based, but completely different. The Beatles were an art, they were, they, they were an art band. They were like, they were art rock as the, much as they were punk rock or pop rock. The Stones were a blues band, very blues good. Band. The bad boys. Very, very good and very bad, it's like bad boys. Too. And super cool, but n never the twain shall meet. And you, as far as Zeppelin and the Stones, like, are they even close? I don't no, no. It was just a, it was just one of the arguments because our neighborhood was very music centric. Yeah, it was. The parties were all about. Tell me about, about the Doors because that was also in the '80s. The Doors came back. Well, you know, back because they. Well, that's because of uh, uh, a lot to do with the Vietnam sort of the post-Vietnam sort of analysis movies like from Apocalypse, Apocalypse now to. Oh. Uh, you know what? That's Greek music. Yeah, you that's, think the blues are heavy? Angry, right? You think the blues are heavy? <laughs> Nobody's got like nobody gets sadder than a sad Greek person oh, who's yeah. like lost his love. Saga Paul. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, at my school at Mac, yep. when you you could you could still smoke on the premises. You didn't have to be 35 meters behind the line, though. No, no. We no. we had two areas, right? The front of the school, oh, yeah, and the yeah. back of the school. It did change a bit. Well. The back of the school was where all the rockers were. Like, so you had your your jacket from Marks, your red and black jacket from Marks Work Warehouse, your jean jacket cut off with either Rush, Zeppelin, The Who, The Stones, The Doors, or or uh, the Scarborough Tuxedo, right? Yeah, the Scarborough Tuxedo. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Wayne's World, basically. And then in the front, you had the discos, right? Who smoked the 125 mill milliliter <laughs> cigarettes? Like they were this long. And all the hottest chick, like I mean, in the back it was mostly guys, and mostly rough-looking guys. In the front it was a couple of guys and lots of girls. And you know, like I, being a Gemini, I could sort of like drift between both camps because I had respect for the Bee Gees. Like you know, they're still a rock-type band. Um, but in the back it was like Zeppelin, or if you if that wasn't hard enough, it was like Deep Purple. And if that wasn't hard enough, it was Deeper Purple or like <laughs> Yes. Tormato, yes. or you know, and it certainly was stuff that whether you thought about it or whether you, th you know, it permeated your soul, whether you realize it or not, sure. and came back to be an influence in your life. And I think for the best, you know, because we we have all people, all sorts of people have all sorts of influences. It's acknowledging them, accepting them, and then going forward with them that. You know, as you as you go through life with people, and that makes you, uh, you know, makes your life valid, makes things great. You know, so I liked it all. And as a matter of fact, lately I've been getting way more into Yes than I was at the time. Way more into Genesis than I was at the time. Like Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, like the record. I have a live version of it too, and it's just like holy. And that's a band I wish I could have seen. You know, if you could go, like, you know how people say like. Peter Gabriel days of Genesis. Peter Gabriel days of Genesis. The last, the, the real, the peak days when they were doing uh, uh, Supper's Ready and that, and it's like, because he really could oh. talk about pushing the envelope. Oh, I mean, man. he. That's what I liked about Genesis versus Yes. Like, it was an, seemed more organic and more out, more like. Peter deep. was a character. He really was, and I loved his solos. Like, I loved where he went, and I think I still yeah. have great respect for him. Oh, and, yeah. He started real world rec. He basically brought world music to North America, like, you know, as far as... That's a good credit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I met him, actually. I did meet wow. him. I said hello to him um, backstage at the Us tour cool. uh, the last time I saw him. And I uh, also met... Uh, uh, and that was right around the time of uh, So. Yeah, it was just after So. It was like nine ninety one. Um, and then I met... Uh, uh, what's his name? From the guy from Squeeze, uh, Til Tilbrook, and you know where I met him? I met him at uh, uh, that uh, club that was at Bathurst and Queen. It's called uh, 
the Big sure. Bop. I met yeah, him. At, Big Bop. I met Glenn Tilbrook at the Big Bop. I saw him play by himself. Two fat ladies, window shop, something for the mantelpiece. I mean, there were maybe a hundred people in the audience. First act, intermission, comes back, he goes, all right, I'd like to do some karaoke. Come up and I'll play your favorite squeeze song. So he had <laughs> audience members come up and oh, sing so songs. Great. He did the backing vocals and played the guitar. At the end of the night, Myers comes up and does BBC One, BBC Two, blah, blah, blah with them. And it was like, I mean, it was so great to see that. The other person I, I met and spoke with and actually had a nice chat about songwriting was, uh, was, uh, uh, the guy from Crowded House, um, Neil Finn. What the heck? So, at the BBC end of the night, BBC One, BBC Two. He did, yeah, because he just, he just, um, must have been hilarious. He just premiered. I, I think that uh, the first Austin, it was the first Austin Powers, right? Yeah. He comes up, and, and nobody knew it was him. He goes, all right, well, and we, the last request is, uh, oh, come on up, and Tilbrook brings him up, and he's like, you know, Mike Myers. He's like goofy and hilarious, and. He's like the one, two, three, four, baby, see what? And then everybody was like singing the song. It was, oh my it was great. It was like, it was a connected thing. And that's, <laughs> that, like that experience is what you get at, in the old days at Maple Leaf Gardens. The last time I went to a show at the, at the Sky Dome, I saw uh, Roger Waters, The Wall. And it was great. I cried. Like, I mean, seeing stuff that you grew, that shaped you as, mm -hmm. as a kid. But what struck me, what kind of was a bit of a, a, a buzzkill was just how corporate everything was. I mean, you, you know, back in the days, like you had a wineskin at the, at the gardens, you get patted down, they know you had a wineskin, and they <laughs> let you go through. There'd be a huge ball bouncing around from 1050 Chum. People would be like passing dubs along, and you know, and back then it was okay to take it and know that you're not gonna wind up in Peru missing a kidney. I mean, it wasn't like, oh my God, where am I? Because it was, Clean, I guess. Clean drugs, you know. Um, but but you could stand around. You could smoke. I mean, okay, I get the whole smoking thing. But at the ACC, I went to the bathroom at one point in the intermission. They're like, right this way, sir. Right this way, sir. And, and then I was like, there was. I didn't know where the washroom was. I stood still for maybe three seconds. Uh, are you lost? Can I help you? Oh like some guy with a with a baton or like with yeah, a. Yeah, high It's like wow, yeah. Well, I mean, I get it, it's, but I don't get it. I. I, I I'm so there's, you know. There's a couple of ways to act and play music and, and approach art art in yeah. general, yeah. Which is, you know, you're technically accurate. You have to practice until you get it perfect, and then you can add your flavor. Yes. Or just kind of go in with flavor, and it's all me, and I, just how I'm doing it. It, it yeah. I mean, it depends. <laughs> well, you know, as a comment, it's like. It, it depends on, on, on the nature of, of the project that, in other words, if it's something that's close to, to a, a very a strong experience that you can absolutely relate to like that, uh, then, then you go in with a lot of flavor and you just, you know, serve the lines and the, and the characters uh, who you're playing, your partner, right? In other words, the, you've got to take, the rea you've got to take your reaction truly off of what your partner gives you. Otherwise, that's it's. It looks fake. It is fake, right? I mean, the whole thing is an illusion, but there has to be truth in the illusion. And what you're striving for is as close to the truth of the situation as possible. As you know. I mean, let's put it this way: people think it's people think every everything that is done well looks easy. Yes. Because 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 it is so difficult to master. And in order to master something, you have to commit to it. I remember I had this teacher once who said it takes 20 years to make an actor, 20 years to, to complete an actor, to really get it, which is kind of like the equivalent of uh, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. In other words, you've got to do stuff and fall down. You've got to throw a million left hooks before it becomes perfect and you can effortlessly box, like when you watch boxers. They don't even, they, I mean, yeah. If you inside that, it's crazy. The technique is yeah. it's invisible, but it's but it's technique. Or hockey, or, or ho anything, or Sydney, music. any anything, M music and acting. But but the thing about acting is there is no. I mean, you don't see an instrument. It doesn't look like someone's like, oh my god, that is the instrument is what intimidates people. When an a, a great actor is intimidating, the instrument is invisible. You, you're the instrument. Marlon Brando's the instrument, or whatever, right? So, so if if you've never done something like you have to be someone who who 
kills people for a living, you know, you're not going to go out and become an assassin or a hitman or whatever. But but you got to touch on the not what it, not technically what it's like to shoot a gun, but what kind of a head right. does it take to do that? What is the experience that leads up to that? Who are the people in that person's life? You know, and if they're people who are not in your life, then then you got to go and do some work. But if you're playing someone who hangs out at Johnny's Hamburgers and plays in a crazy little English Beatles band from Scarborough, you you know, you don't have to do the work because you are the work, you know. You're it. You're it. So <laughs> so this, but the same goes with. Uh, what is that called in acting? When that's called it, a personality. Uh, it's like getting De Niro. You don't need De Niro to do anything well, but be De Niro. But, but, but it's funny because the De Niro, for so many of his movies, was anything but the De Niro. Like, who is De Niro, right? Right. He's Jake LaMotta. Who's J he's that guy. Uh, uh, Rupert Pupkin, he's that guy. And you look at those two different those two characters. And I remember someone's like saying, I, who, who do you think is more dangerous? <laughs> Rupert Popkin or Jake LaMotta? It's like, whoa, LaMotta. It's like, no, 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 Rupert Popkin's way more dangerous because he's like, hey, come on, can I get a break over here? Like, he's, he's passive-aggressive, manipulative, but capable of murder, you know, at the same time. Whereas Travis Bickle or, or LaMotta's like a, a raging bull. Travis Bickle's like the damaged goods, like a damaged little boy. Anyway, so that guy is the opposite of the personality actor. However, the guys who are like... Um, uh, like let's say John Belushi or like a lot of the comics, right? Uh, John Belushi, uh, uh, Will Ferrell, who I love, uh, Jerry Lewis, for instance. Mike Myers. Mike Myers, yeah. Well, Mike Myers, Eric McCormick, <laughs> who's not a comic but he can do comedy. Yeah. Um, Very well. well. You'll you'll see like ah oh, you know they'll come up to you and they'll be taking selfies while you're trying to have a hamburger. They're like, oh you're just like the, the characters. No 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 no. That's still craft. You just have right. to do it. Like, you happen to be Jack Tripper on Three's Companies, and you're all like people know you, and it's lighthearted. But it doesn't mean that it's that it's easy. So that's where it becomes. Technical. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's face it. Uh, uh, anything that you, even even news footage of something happening live on the street, is still filtered through the camera and the camera maker, the person who's filming it. So. Reality is, is, is up for grabs as a concept. Like reality television, the furthest thing from reality that I, I, I've watched movies with puppets that are more real than reality television. Give me a break. So, but the, but the whole process is, the, the, the whole thing about it is enjoying the process and committing to the process, you know? Well, I think in that way, I think what you just were touching on to me means that somebody's still pulling the string saying that you know, I'm putting this schmuck over here with this cool person here, and I'm just going to see how that develops. Well, exactly, and that you know what that is? That's directing. That is like that is a ringleader. That is a puppet mm -hmm. master. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about it. Um, like you know, it's like the the the, the real go-to example is you find out later on that Marlon Perkins, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, is like, we're gonna watch this baboon, you know, who is like native of, of Asia, sort of like duke it out with a, with a cheetah, you know, like, like, and you realize after, like, pull back from the, the savannah, and there's a little fence, and they're like stuck together, you know? So, so oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's oh, you didn't know that, huh? No, <laughs> well, yeah, that there was a lot of, there was, the, there was a lot of staging to see. Oh, gosh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's nasty. It but, is nasty. And, and that stuff happens. I mean, but the history still, of Western civilization can be pretty yeah, nasty. There we go. Yeah. And, and then we're trying to set examples for the rest of the world, which we don't oh, have any the, right to the, 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 like, I mean, the wonderful hypocrisy. I mean, the, the, the lovely butter tart hypocrisy. It, it, it's like, it, 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 you know, warms my heart. I want to make doilies. I want to learn how to crochet <laughs> sometimes. But let me just, to your point that we were talking about Trudeau earlier, let me just say this. Right. The thing about Trudeau is like, he, yeah, he was, an, he, he was authoritarian when he needed to be and he made no bones about it. He didn't apologize. Like him or hate him, and I've done both. He brought in War Measures Act, said you can't even spit on the sidewalk because, there's, because it's, it's martial law. When it's done, he said, who am I going to tell you that you can't do what you're going to do? So yeah, for real. There's no such thing as a person or a leader or, or, or someone who's setting an example that's not going to have their, their benef benefactors and their detractors. Sure. What's wrong with your camera? 
No, it's okay. I was in the middle of a great point. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Don't no. look at the camera. Bro. Don't go by like you're fighting, like you're fighting. <laughs> um, remember that? Just go by like you're fighting, like you're fighting. I, I remember, but I don't know who it was. It's it's, it's uh, Francis Ford Coppola, oh his cameo in, in Apocalypse Now. Oh my god. He's the news. He's oh, yeah, the uh, yeah. in Vietnam. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like they're like going to do this, and they see the cat, and they're like, huh? He goes, just go by like you're fighting, and they're like. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that yeah. was great. You just went off camera. Just, just, okay, so here's my cameo because he mentioned Coppola. And so crazy because that whole time, you know, usually I'm active listening and all that. But sometimes I have, uh, what's it called? Autobiographical thinking. Yes. You're going, and I'm thinking, i got to remember this. Yeah, after. yeah, yeah. You should ha I keep but a I pad got, with you. I got, but I got this. Okay. I, I, I'm already multitasking today. Okay, I want man. a separate cameraman. You want to juggle. But here's the one. Yeah. Today, I believe, is the 60th anniversary of Hiroshima. It is. It's a uh, little boy that they dropped today. Again, you know what? Don't get... I mean, look... I want to get you started. Well, they, it we had, don't have to do this. Let, 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 let's put no, no, no it's okay. No, no. The, the, it, let's put it this way: because it happened, there's no taking it back. Perhaps if there is a multiverse in another incarnation, it didn't happen, or it happened differently. But the point is, the sacrifice, which is has to be honored and has to be acknowledged and respected and never forgotten, ever forgotten, like they've forgotten about about. Uh, uh, inoculations and and uh, and uh, uh, you know now you got like mumps coming back because we we were so perfect at getting rid of stuff that we forgot about it there's a we mm -hmm. we're so episodic we forget fucking what yes, happened episodic. what am i talking what was i talking about hot so you're not even paying attention anyway um <laughs> but take this Stop looking at the camera man. take take this as 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 a sacrifice but don't take don't 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 disown pay homage and attention and respect to the sacrifice because if it wasn't for I don't think they needed to drop two I don't even think they needed to drop one but they did but one was enough they started the atomic clock after it's like five minutes to midnight now it's at like two minutes or something like it's click closer I mean I don't think it's gonna happen I like to be a, a, a Zen met like I'd like to be a, a transcendental meditator and, and just use like it, it, put vibes it will not happen it will not happen and hopefully if we're fucking smart enough it won't happen but but what like have you seen to this day when you see like this I'm just gonna say you know Bob Marley said oh. emancipate yourself from modern slavery than from mental slavery rather and it, that is Bob Marley is a prophet yeah that is the thing that guides us through is that it, it's not gonna affect us it could kill us, but it's not going to affect no, us. No, no, you're right. And it's very well, that's, that's a, you know what? Here, let me see this for a second. <laughs> Billy Z, that's a great point. That is a great point. Because, I am not a... <laughs> you, know what, you know what my brother my brother said to me? He's a correspondent for um, for uh, CBS. And he said, like, you know, the, fun, the of all the people in Western culture, if you will, the, this amalgamation of Western culture, that he's seen in every country that he's visited Nepal blah 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 Bob Marley it, more than Che Guevara who's that guy on the t-shirt sort of thing mm -hmm. more than the Beatles more than he goes Marley and you know I have Uprising in the car it's actually in the deck right now and like I listen to that record and it's it's healing to listen to that Absolutely. record you know, there's certain people like I met this this woman the other day say, say you it you can go full circle because uh, your guys uh, that are still alive, Paul and Ringo. Yeah. Ringo is such a spreader of love and peace. It's, you know, it's really heartwarming to see him. He is. I mean, you know what? He is because I don't think, I don't think any, it's been lost on either uh, McCartney or Ringo of just what they, what they contributed to the society that we live in. I mean, imagine... Uh, uh, imagine if the Beatles didn't happen. Imagine, I mean, I mean, you can't, but because they did. But, but like, the best comments we've ever had as a band have been like what I'm saying. But one time we played, the last time we played the exhibition, we got these four college guys. Like we're talking about, you know, Phi Kappa Lambda guys, like clean cut, preppy, 
big boys. And I was taking my stuff down to the car, and they, they approached me, and I'm like, holy shit, what, uh, I'm in trouble now. And they go, hey, you. I go, yeah, who, me? <laughs> and they said, yeah, listen, I just wanted to thank you. You guys were so good. Listen, brother, I have so many problems. We stayed for two hours. You guys took my problems away. And I'm like, that's what it's all about. Like, that's what that's about. And, and that's what, when someone has a profound experience at a concert or a movie or seeing someone help somebody else out and it touches their heart, try to run with it like the baton in the relay race before you pass it on to someone else towards a, a finish line. You know what I mean? Run with it. Run with it. Musicians in bars getting beer. Thanks, Billy. Thank you so Constantine, much. Constantine Alexandra Carzis. You just call me, uh, call me what you will, you know. Alex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Al. Yeah, call me Al. You um, can call me Al. You can call me Al. And uh, thanks, thanks, Bill. And, and uh, it's Cheers, good to be here. Alexander. Cheers. Awesome. Cheers. <laughs> Brother, that was great. Okay, I wrote this, it's called Musicians, what's it called? Musicians in Bars Getting Beer. Say it again. Musicians <laughs> in Bars Getting Beer. <laughs>